This one's dripping quite a bit. And that's how the sap comes out of the tree. Just drips at a time. Imagine having to get 40 gallons at one drip at a time. All right. But we'll slowly work to evaporate. And I can skim all the leaves and twigs and everything else, pine needle stuff that gets in there. And even though I'm making syrup right now, for me, that's not what my end goal is. Um, you know, I want, I want sugar uh, and for a couple different reasons. Um, you know, one, I don't really have uh, a way of keeping the syrup. Um, it would still, there's still enough moisture in there that uh, it would spoil. Um, and the sugar to me is a much more useful product. You know, so when I make maple sugar, I'm doing it specifically for the sugar. That I'll use in all the same ways that you use sugar today. So any kind of baking, you know, you make a pie, a cake. Uh, you want to sweeten your tea or coffee. You know, all those things I use maple sugar for. Um, and it's exactly the same kind of sugar as cane sugar, it just comes from a different plant. Um, and of course, sugar cane doesn't grow around here, but maple trees do, so. So it's drawing up that energy out of the ground, and we kind of hijack a little bit of that energy and boil it down into a syrup, which is nice and sweet, but without refrigeration in the 1830s, that syrup very quickly will go moldy when the weather gets warm. So you want to bring it all the way to the sugar stage, which is a um, a loaf of sugar, about four pounds per gallon is what you're going to get out of a gallon of, 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 uh, of syrup. And that will keep it definitely. Sugar itself is a preservative. So they're doing most of the heavy lifting. They're collecting all that sap. Averages about 40 gallons of sap for one gallon of syrup. And then I'm taking it to the end stage, that, that final stage, where taking the rest of the liquid out to make it into the loaf of sugar, using these molds, which are lined on the inside, glazed, and it has a hole in the bottom. I got one yesterday, had a happy accident happen. I was looking for the jar, I put this in because it's got a plug in the bottom. Um, and I couldn't find the jar, and somebody gave me lunch, and she moved the jar over there, and I. And I'm looking around, and by the time I came back, it was sugar. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I bought. So it usually doesn't look like that. <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> it was pretty good. So doing, uh, doing the, 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 the easy work compared to what the guys are doing at the, at the sugar camp. What's the difference between the dark sugar and the lighter sugar? This would have been uh, collected earlier in the season. This is later. This also has a lot of molasses that is trapped in the, in the, in the cone of sugar because... Um, molasses is that part of the sugar making process that doesn't crystallize and this for some reason it just didn't drain out huh, okay. where this one did interesting in fact this one weighs twice as much as this one <laughs> and it's much smaller it's, it's really I mean I, t I picked it up and, wow it was a difference making what are called the staves which are the side pieces for a barrel and I'll need about 20 eventually I'll fit them all together with some loops and go from there the ways to go but I'm doing some of the initial shaping which uh, I've got some handy tools what I'm sitting on is called a shaving horse and the shaving horse is really a foot powered vice I push down there with my foot and clamps down they call it the blockhead actually that holds that piece of wood in place, and then I can use a very sharp two-handed draw knife to shape the wood. 
this gives me a lot of control. Everything we make is round, so each of the staves, the side pieces like this, has to be rounded on the outside, which is what I'm doing now. And then I'll make sure it's straight all the way down, and then I'll flip it around to do the curve that goes the other way. Uh, the inside curve, I actually have a more specialized knife, a uh, following knife, and that does the scooping out step this way. steps because we don't measure the you know use templates or patterns you really just have to train your eye to see it and uh, it takes a lot of experience to be able to do that but that's why we're how long will it take you to make the bucket you're making well, a full-size barrel probably would have been a good day or most of the day at least for, for a village some welding and some shaping um, and right now we're working on technically the arms which have the flutes on there. You see that? Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Looks so now good. I have the other one to make and then we got to somehow stick them to that. So all the pieces are made but now there's a time, it's time for assembly. So we're doing just a little arcing here just to make it to make it look right. Oh, 
Oh yeah, sure. Minor point. Complaining. <laughs> Doctor pay. <laughs> so just making sure these both are pretty much sets. That's pretty Look good to me. I like okay. it. Right. Well, I guess this one's hot. So let's work with this one. So now we gotta stick them together. So I have a big end here. How is it gonna work? So we'll choreograph this. It's gonna take some time to heat up. I'm gonna come out of the fire with these two hot pieces. Lay it like that. And then, bang, he's gonna hit right there. And we're gonna hope that all works out. them painted very much like this tea canister. Mm -hmm. Would you paint them yourself or would you? Uh, for me as the master, I would I would only specialize in doing the metal work. Would um, you have? Um, would, would your apprentice paint them? I, I would likely have somebody that just does that. Gotcha. Um, so it could be a man, it could be a woman. You know, it's not a, a gender specific trait. Our job, mm -hmm. um, but some items you strictly see painted, like this top bottom here. Beautiful. Yeah, that is so it may take you a couple years to to learn the trade of doing japaning, as it was called. Uh, but once you did it, you're not only gonna see people doing it on tin plate. You might see, especially young ladies, I found doing clock faces or glass um, the mirrors. The pink glass. So, you know, you may be hired for a certain amount of period of time to do this kind of work, and then once that's over, you get a contract to go and work for a clock maker, and then kind of bounce back and forth okay. if you work it out right. Uh, whereas a shop like this, if I'm offering that kind of stuff, I'm likely buying it from another shop that does that. Uh, my shop wouldn't be set up for something like that. punched out, then I can round them and then solder them together. edges curve now I can shape that by hand
um, typically we do it in May or June, so we haven't done it yet this year. And we cut off that extra wool, clean it, card it, which is brushing out the tangles. I don't know if you've been down to our carding mill. And then after that, I can just pull out my wool and then I'll spin my wheel and turn it into yarn. So as I turn my wheel, I have a cotton band here that it turns and then another cotton band that turns the spindle. And as the spindle turns, the yarn falls off the end and puts a twist all the way up this piece. So if you watch right here, do you see it falling off? Yeah. Yes. So that puts a twist all the way up. So when I do it fast, it twists it really fast so then it's really tight. And then what I'm doing right now is just pulling out the loose fibers. Um, um, so that I don't have lumps in my wool. And then I will wind it onto the back. This one, I got to the end of a piece. So I'll start my next piece. This is already in yarn form. So I will fluff up this other one, put it underneath it so that they're, they're next to each other. And then I will spin that wheel again and it will become one piece. That's cool. Yes. And usually, because you can, I think you can kind of see from there how thin this is. So it's it still, even though it's pretty strong, it's still slightly breakable. So what I end up doing is putting two pieces together. So then I have a thicker yarn like that. And then I'll dye it and knit it into all these different things that you see here. What do you dye it with, like berries and Good, yeah, good question. We don't usually use berries except for food because they work more like a stain than a dye. Okay. So even though they won't come out of our white shirts, they still <laughs> will eventually wash out. So we usually use trees, um, other types of flowers and plants, um, and some kind of crazy items too. So we'll start with the yellow. The yellow has a lot of different things. You could do onion skins, you could do tansy, Queen Anne's lace, or goldenrod. Mm -hmm. Or you could do fustic, which is a tree from Mexico. So you could buy a chunk of that wood at the store, turn it into sawdust and let it soak for a week or two, and then boil it to get a color like this. Now, an exception to the plants and things like that would be this one right here. This is actually dyed with cochineal beetles. Mm -hmm. So beetles that are from Mexico and South America, they eat the fruit of the prickly pear cactus plant, which is a bright pink mm -hmm. color. Mm -hmm. So then they would just collect those dried beetles, ship them around the world so you could buy them here at this store, crush them up and boil them to get a bright pink like this. Very cool. I actually even have some. You can't really see the color. You have to crush them to get the color. Those the beetles? But yes, the these are the beetles. <laughs> They don't. They're, they're dried up, so you really can't taste? see them. <laughs> well, interestingly, they're actually used today in some natural food colorings. Oh. So you get the color, but it's not with a chemical. So natural food colorings and natural makeup still sometimes has, has them in there. And then some other things that we use, black walnuts, just the outside shell for a good brown color. Um, sage, like kitchen sage with some iron to get a good green color. Um, the blues came from indigo, which is a plant being grown in India. But you could also use logwood, a tree from the West Indies. Again, just a chunk of wood that you could buy at the store. Um, this one, so these are actually dyed with the same thing. It's Brazil wood, a tree from Brazil. So this is the color if you just boil with the um, sawdust. This one, if you add iron to the dye bath, it turns it purple. Mm. And then you might see the difference between some of these. Um, if you dye, the first time you dye with the dye bath, you get a really bright color. The second time you get a lighter color, kind of like with the tea bag. The first time you use it, you get a lot of color and a lot of flavor. The second time you use it, you still get some. It's just not quite as much as the first time. So you can get lighter colors and use the dye bath in other 